So our next speaker is, uh, he's the head of the Merriman Education Foundation. Uh, you've no doubt heard his podcast, Sound Investing, uh, which goes back several decades. Still writes a column that appears every other week at uh, Market Watch. I brought this piece of paper up here, Paul, because I wanted to make sure I had this right. Paul is also the recipient of the American Association of Individual Investors James Clunan Award for Excellence in Investment Education. Now, here's the things that's not on here. Uh, Paul and uh, our relationship goes back 35 years, which is a long friendship, and I appreciate uh, every one of those years. Paul also got me into this business back in the late 90s, and we were partners for over a decade, a time I really enjoyed. But over that period of time, I figured out that I only ever beat him at one thing. I was only ever better than Paul Merriman at one thing. And do you remember what that was? You probably, you probably pushed that. I beat him at a game of pickleball about 15 years ago. That's the only time I, I've ever bested Paul Merriman. My friend, colleague, Paul Merriman, please give him a warm welcome. Pickleball. It is uh, really wonderful to uh, be a friend of Tom's for all these years. It is a highlight of my life, and I really truly mean that. Uh, and uh, I cannot remember a time when he didn't have a smile on his face and, uh, and a joke if you wanted one. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the work they're doing in educating people because uh, as I tried in building our firm uh, to educate people, and it didn't matter whether they became a client or not, the idea was just to make people more aware of the right thing to do from what we know about the past. And so today, Tom is still doing what I used to do, and that is helping people manage their money. But when I sold our firm, uh, back in 2012, I gave up the money management business and the investment advisory business, and I became what I love doing most of all, I think, and that is teaching. And the reason that teaching is, I think, the best way for me to help people is because I can get to potentially so many people as opposed to sitting down one by one, which was great fun too. But the fact that I'm here able to share this with you today, and next uh, Thursday I'll be doing the same thing in Arizona, uh, where there are some seven or 800 doctors and dentists that are coming to a conference. I love the teaching. But the teaching means I've got to somehow help not only you with your thoughts about investing, but maybe the next generation. How many have actually struggled with how do we tell young people how to get involved, how to invest. Is that a problem for people? It is for a lot of people. And I may, I may touch on that today as I'm gonna be talking about three, this is a different title than what you have in the program, three keys to long-term investment success. And my hope is, is that as I do my work as the, working for the foundation, our mission is to give do-it-yourself investors everything they need to be able to make a good decision on their own. That is the goal. We need to give you the tools and the information. And the fact is, that means that what we're trying to do is to give you the same information that we would, in fact, need uh, as a manager. Because as a do-it-yourself investor, you have the responsibility of taking care of the most important client in the world, yourself. It means you have to run around one side of the desk and ask yourself a question and then go around and answer it. And you need to ask hard questions. In fact, you need to add, ask those hard questions with your spouse there with you. This is not as easy as it sounds. Because for many of us, money has a lot of emotional levels that, we're, that are just part of our lives, how we feel when we go shopping. It doesn't matter if we're just going to get a, a blouse for my wife. I, I fear it might get beyond that. And, and so we all have as these things that we're, we were raised with uh, in terms of, of concern about money. So... It is my view that most people probably are going to need some help 
but for those who can do it on their own, I'm here to help, but so are a lot of other people here to help. And the reality is, if you're going to do it on your own, and I think Tom and Don do a great job of educating people who are do-it-yourselfers on their program and in the work that they do with podcast and the, and, the, and the video and all. But the bottom line is, is that we don't trust many people anymore. We don't trust the government. We don't trust Wall Street. We don't trust salespeople. We're not sure what to believe on the internet anymore, right? I mean, they're learning more and more how to, how to, I'll call it, scam us, although it appears to be legal, the things that they do. It's hard to find a source that you can trust. So I am here to advocate for two things in particular. I want you to follow the math. If I could get young people to understand that all they need to do to understand that investment process and what it means in your life is to follow the math. Because the math is guaranteed. If I, for example, had a situation, and you've got a handout that has this uh, in it, if I had a situation where somebody was putting away $6,000 a year, I can show them the math. I can show them that if you put away $6,000 a year over 40 years and you made 8% a year and then you retired and you made 6% a year and you took 4% to live on, I know exactly how much money you have at retirement at 65. You'd have about $1.7 million. If you took withdrawals of 4% and you continued to, to, to get 6%, you would take withdrawals of $2.6 million. Then you die theoretically. This is all theoretical because it's just the math. And you die at 95 and you leave your heirs some $2.8 million. It's just the math. Which means that you either took out or left to others about $5.5 million. Guaranteed. On the other hand, if you as an investor could find some way to make an extra half of 1%, that would mean that instead of ending up with $5.5 million in distributions and in, in uh, what you leave to others, you'd end up with about $7 million. You would have added $1.5 million if you could just find an extra half of 1%. Anybody even have an idea how you might do that? Of course you do. You know lots of ways to make an extra half of 1%. Maybe you wouldn't pay that load to buy a mutual fund on an equity fund. That turns out to be a half a percent over a lifetime, a year. Maybe it's a lower expense. Maybe putting 10% more equity in your portfolio. Maybe being wise about taxes. There's so many ways you could pick up an extra half of 1%. But what if you could find them a 1% advantage? In my book, we're talking millions, and there'll be a link to a free copy of it if you'd like it. We have 12 ways that we believe, and most of them are opportunities that if you put them together, there'd be no problem getting up to 1%. You might even get up to 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. And so it seems like it's possible that you might make 9 instead of 8. It's possible you might make 7 instead of 6. If you could, you would end up now with a, an extra... $3.5 million. Notice that's more than twice the 1.5 you were going to get before on the half a percent. So the bigger that number gets, the, the bigger the bigger number is that you end up with, or your heirs do. And one of the things I make very clear to young people, you are in a business. You're in the business of investing. And it is a real business. And in fact, it's a partnership between you as the senior partner and what Benjamin Graham, old-fashioned Benjamin Graham, called Mr. Market. Today he might not call it Mr. Market, 
But the bottom line is, is that you're in partnership because you're putting your money, if you're looking for growth, in the stock market. And so you're the senior partner, you're putting the money into the business, and then the market is trying to grow it. And in the early years, what do we know? The early years, what you make at the end of the year or have in the account is mostly because of what you put in. So you get the first $6,000 investment in there. Maybe it makes $600, but you put the $600 in. You are definitely the senior partner. And in that portfolio, you have millions of people working for you. You, you. We all understand that in this room. Some people, young people, don't realize they have millions of people working for you in these public companies. And yes, you only own a small part, but it's a... It's an equal part for what you have invested in those companies. And so after a number of years, you as the senior partner, even though you're still saving, the, the market is doing more and more of what makes it valuable to you. So eventually, the money you put in each year, each year is relatively small compared to what it grows to be. And young people really need to understand this. Because it's very simple, and it's all math. That 3% in this particular case, this table 3 only makes one change. It asks you as the senior partner to increase the amount you put in by 3% a year. And by simply doing that, you end up with an additional $3.5 million over the person who didn't do that with the, seven and the, the 9 and the 7% return. So, I mean, every time you up the ante, even though it's a small amount of money in the beginning, it's hard for young people to understand how it grows and grows. When I was in my 20s, and I was in the securities business for a few years, young people wanted generally, someday, God help me, I want a million dollars. And I teach at Western Washington University once a quarter, and the kids are still looking up and say, I want a million dollars. They have no idea about inflation, do they? <laughs> and they've got to learn about that. That's also math. That commitment by the individual investor, and the, and the last one I want to share with you, table four here, is about the person who delays for five years. And oftentimes there's a parent or a grandparent that could help a child or a grandchild make those early investments. And it would be a lot more valuable to them than leaving them money later because that money will get into an account that will compound, hopefully tax-free. Maybe even get a match in a 401k. But what we do know is this, is if you just wait five years with that $6,000, and you're working on the assumption of 9% during the accumulation, 7% during the distribution, there is a $4.7 million difference because of that initial five-year investment. And it's interesting. I teach classes uh, sometimes to all engineers in college. And one of the things that they're fascinated by is the implications of starting early. Now, I mentioned that they're engineers because they know math, and yet they are still surprised at that impact of those early years. And oftentimes, they'll say, and I'm starting right now. Then, after we really get a sense of how the math of investing works for us, now I want people who are going to be at do-it-yourself investors to learn to follow the history because without a good grasp of the history, your expectations for what's likely to happen to you are, are not very good sometimes. You, you expect more than you're likely to get. You're very optimistic. Investors, their nature is to be optimistic, otherwise they probably have their money in bonds. Okay? So follow the history. Biggest decision we make in our life, other than saving, is the decision of stocks or bonds. And the reason that's a big deal, you can see it right here, the fixed income returns from 1928 to 1921, uh, 2021, 
you will see that $100 grew to be worth somewhere between $2,000 and $16,000 for short-term government paper and long-term government paper. So that's what $100 grew to over 94 years. During that same period of time, the S&P 500, $100 grew to almost a million. If you were in large cap value only, that was the S&P 500 there a combination of growth and value. If you had value, it was over two million. If you had small cap blend, it was over four million. And if you had small cap value, the gold ring of investment asset classes, you would have had over $13 million. That is the history. That does not guarantee the future, right? And it also, by the way, now all of a sudden exposes you to how bad investing can be. And how bad can it be? Does anybody remember October 19th, 1987? That's how bad it can be. The market lost 22% in one day. There was talk of depression. There was concern that money market funds would even be able to meet their $1 mark. So I believe that if we can really get a sense of the history of investing, we are more likely to stay the course because that's the, that is what we're looking for is what steps can we take or those who follow us that we can help that will stay the course for their lifetime. My wife and I just gave money to our newly born first granddaughter. We put money in an account, gave it to the, my, uh, my daughter, and that money is invested half in the S&P 500s, half in small cap value, until that granddaughter will be able to take money out of that and use it to fund a Roth IRA for however long that investment will last. And we've written a lot about these kinds of things to do for young people. And so when I'm looking at the long term, my granddaughter could actually have her investment that she has made in November of last year work for 94 years. As a matter of fact, what they say, the actuaries say, actuarials uh, projections are that she'll live to be over 100. A 50-50 chance she'll live to be over 100. So when I look at these numbers, what I know is, is that most people in this room are not going to use this stuff for the next 94 years. I know I'm not. By the way, when people say how they feel about taxes, I understand Don says we don't. I love taxes. I'm 79, and without those uh, taxes, where would I be? Because we need people to pay those taxes, do we not? Oh, well. The other choice you have in this table, in fact, let me take you to the next table, because I want to talk about being serious about selecting equity asset classes. I want you to notice that when we look at 40-year periods, I love this, the average 40-year period return of the S&P 500 going back to 1928 was an 11% compound rate of return. How could it go from 10.2 to 11? That's a big jump. Because in a, in a 40 year period, yeah, you had some 40 year periods where you had money like in 31 and 32 and 33. And it impacted the 40 years, but it only impacted the 40 years. When you get beyond 33 and you, in, and you look at 40 years, the returns go up appreciably. But the average good times and bad has been 11%. And large cap value without the growth in it 13.5, small cap blend 13.7, and small cap value 16.2. And I don't live with any hope that it's going to be 16.2 again. I'm also not sure whether it'll ever be 11% again for the S&P 500. We don't know. Totally unknown. But I do know this that all of us in this room believe in diversification, right? That's why we have the S&P 500. That's how we have more than the S&P 500. We have some large cap value, some small cap value, probably have some REITs. We have some international, we have some emerging markets. We have huge diversification. 
Oftentimes, I think it is overlooked that people think that diversification is about the number of stocks. In fact, the most important kind of diversification that we do when we're talking mutual funds is diversification of different asset classes. I may have a thousand companies in one asset class. I don't care about any of them. I care about the size of those companies. I care whether they're growth or their value. I care whether they're U.S. or they're, or, or, or they're international. But I do know this, and it shows it right here. The U.S. four fund strategy, 25% in each of those four equity asset classes. The compound rate of return was 2.7% better than the S&P 500. And if you look at some of the studies we've done, there is virtually no more risk to the downside historically. Now, by the way, we have over 160 tables like this on our website. And that is our best attempt of trying to help people is if we can get them to look at those tables. But here's one that I just love. <laughs> because if somebody will tell me that the S&P 500 is green and I know that I'm looking at every year in the market since 1928, I know how many times... Green was the best versus small cap value versus small cap blend versus large cap value and versus the four fund strategy. And I can see there's no pattern of when the green is at the top and the green is at the bottom. We know that green is supposed to be at the bottom. Why? Because it is expected to have the lowest rate of return because it's the highest quality index. There's no magic to that at all. The ride will not be as great theoretically. But notice something here. The, 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 the blue is small cap value. It's at the top a lot of the time, not all of the time, about half of the time. The rest of the time, it's below, sometimes at the bottom, even though it's supposed to be at the top. But the market doesn't deliver us returns one year at a time. It deliver, delivers the return over long periods of time. But I want you to see something about that combination of the four U.S. fund groups, those four asset classes. Notice the purple. The purple's almost always kind of in the middle or a little bit above or a little bit below. This is one year at a time. The purple is way less risky in terms of volatility, than the S&P 500. And that's the power of diversification. That's what makes it so special. And by the way, there are periods like 2000 through 2009. Anybody remember how bad it was for the S&P 500 during that period of time? Guess what? The four fund strategy compounded at about 5% a year. All I'm saying is, I know so many young people who are putting all their money in either the total market index or the S&P 500 if they're putting money in stocks at all because somebody in the book said you don't have to do anything more than the total market index. And I'm just saying if you do that and you can and it'll be fine, but your chances of leaving more, living on more, or retiring early would probably be worth understanding that the four fund strategy is better. I know these numbers are small, but you've got them in your handout. I oh, you don't have this one. Uh, but I'm going to look at it from 30,000. I want you to know what this is. This is the most popular table we have <laughs> by hundreds of thousands over the other tables that we have. This one shows on the left-hand side the rate of return of the S&P 500 one year at a time since 1970. And then forget about it all the way to the right, but right next to it, it's 100% in small cap value. So you can see, as a matter of fact, the green is where that particular asset class did the best and of, the, of, the, of the different choices. The other choices are, you can have 90-10, 80-20, 70-30. You can mix and match the S&P 500 with small cap value. There are a fair number of retirees in this room, and I am one of them. 
And a lot of them do not have any small cap value. But I want to show you, if, as you look at the next page, I want to think in terms of history and I want to think in terms of math here. On the next page, and you've got this one, this shows the bottom line. The annualized returns for all these different combinations of either the S&P 500 or small cap value on their own or combinations of each. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way across. What do I learn? I learned that when you have 100% S&P 500, it was an 11% annualized return, compound rate of return, and if you just added 10% small cap value, it increased the return by four tenths of 1%, and the risk was about the same. In fact, you can go all the way out to 30% in small cap value, which produced Again, you're not, you can't buy the past, so I don't want to suggest this is what you're going to get. But you would have gotten, looking backwards, 12.1% versus 11. So you would have picked up over 1%. And that's a meaningful number no matter what age you are. And I look at the worst 12 months. The worst 12 months for the S&P 500 was a loss of 43.3. For the 30% small cap value, it was 45.1. You lost about 2% more one time over 12 months in order, in essence, to pick up an additional 1%. And I think that's worth consideration. Oh, by the way, I also... Uh, I love over to the far right here, you'll see the S&P 500, how many years it outperformed, how many years small cap value outperformed, and you'll see the S&P 500 was the best in 24 of the years, small cap value it was 28, it's not like it's a total wipeout, but when small cap value won, it won by a lot more on the upside. That's where its additional volatility comes from. Know the math. Know the history. Follow it. And automate. I do not personally have one dollar invested for fun. Not one. I do not have any interest in any individual company. I mean, I'm not saying that I not interested. My grandson's out looking for a job right now, and he's a techie, and I'm interested in how things are going here locally. But normally, I'm not following me. If Google has good or bad news, it's, it's not impacting me, because my wife and I have in our portfolio 12,000-plus companies. So I can say I've got Google, but I can also say that's great or it doesn't matter because it's just one of thousands and thousands of companies. I do believe the biggest problem we have as investors uh, is that we are drawn to events. We are drawn to things of today, of the period. We are drawn to information on earning surprises, uh, we're, taught, we're drawn to inflation numbers, we're, we're, we're drawn to unemployment, we're drawn to political problems. There are so many events in our life, and these events threaten our commitment to the long-term journey of investing. And honestly, after being in this business for 60 years, I only remember a couple of those events and I shared that with you. I mean, I suspect that I would have a greater memory of a divorce than I would of an October 19th. And by the way, a divorce is way more bigger loss than only 22%. Come on. <laughs> if we can get young people to commit to dollar cost averaging, commit to indexing, uh, they just did an interview of uh, Burton Malkiel. He's still recommending peace ha people have fun with part of their portfolio. And he's still recommending that the S&P 500 should be the, basis, the, the base of your portfolio. But go ahead, have some fun. 
Uh, and that's, by the way, uh, that, that is, I have no problem with that. I just think that it will financially likely be a setback rather than get you to where you're trying to go financially. And, the, and also, I think it's pretty common that we believe that whatever you get is a random event. I know, Tom. I can feel it. <laughs> but I did start late. Did anybody notice that I started late? Come on, three hands. the last 40 years, but I'd be lying. <laughs> Quickly, here's the free book. We're talking millions. Why do I make it free as a PDF so that you will forward it to every young person in your life that you think would help? Here's a book that's also free, Two Funds for Life. This is the, written by the director of uh, uh, research for our foundation. It's a wonderful book on how you can just combine a target date fund and a small cap value and if you want help, you can email me. I do not manage money. I am not an estate planner. I am not an insurance expert. In fact, Tom, you brought me a check. I, I looked. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I forgot. This came in the package that you got today. It's a list of things that financial planners are supposed to be able to help you with. And I think about the little tiny piece of this that I'm helping people with. And it just overwhelms me how much of my financial life I'm probably not doing what I should. <laughs> it is amazing. So, All right, let's give Paul go. a big round of applause, okay? Please. Thank you.